Welcome to Capital Link's Trending News Podcast Series. In this podcast series, we have the opportunity to discuss with company management on recent news and announcements that they have made. I am Nicholas Bornels of Capital Link, and we have today with us Mr. Hamish Norton, the president of Star Bar Carriers. Our discussion today is going to touch upon the company's Q1 2023 uh, recently announced results, but we'll mainly focus on Starbucks development strategy and the dry bulk sector outlook. A quick reminder on our disclaimer, our podcasts are provided purely for informational and educational purposes. They do not constitute investment advice or advice of any kind, and Capital Link bears no responsibility for them. And in terms of disclosure, uh, Capital Link uh, is the investor relations advisor to uh, Starbuck. Now, Starbuck uh, is a global shipping company providing worldwide seaborne transportation solutions in the dry bulk sector. Star, Starbuck's common uh, stock trades on the NASDAQ global select market under the symbol SBLK, and Starbuck operates a fleet of 125 vessels with an aggregate capacity of 13.6 million deadweight tons. And with this, I will uh, welcome Hamish to our uh, interview. Uh, Hamish, thank you very much for being with us. As mentioned, our discussion will focus mainly on your strategy, the key issues related to lead development, chartering, uh, capital allocation, and the dry bulk sector outlook. So let's uh, start with the first question. On uh, Q1 2023, uh, you recently announced results, uh, actually on May 16 of 2023, and you uh, reported a profit of the first quarter with an adjusted net income of 37 million or 36 cents per uh, basic share, and uh, a time charter equivalent of 14,199 per day. Now, traditionally, uh, the first quarter of the year is uh, a seasonally weaker market. And uh, please share with us what were the differences uh, that characterized this Q1 compared to the Q1 of last year, and how has the market developed? Uh, th th thanks, Nicholas, for, for uh, having me on. Uh, so the the results in Q1 of 2023 were a little bit lower than the results in Q1 of 20, 2022, you know, in, in part basically because the the fleet overall grew a little bit due to new buildings exceeding scrapping. Um, but also what happened was that port congestion um, was substantially relieved, um, you know, which which unfortunately happens when whenever the market slows down, um, and the the sum of the port congestion plus the actual growth of the fleet resulted in an effective growth of the fleet of close to eight percent. Um, now, of course, when the market you know tightens up a bit port congestion can come back and and that sort of accelerates the the uh, growth of of charter rates and you know that could happen as soon as q3 and if i'm not mistaken uh Hamish, i think uh, the anticipated slowdown of the fleet as a result of the new regulations have not yet kicked in in q1 that's basically correct um there was uh, some slowdown due to the uh reduction in sulfur uh, in 2020 uh, due to the, to the new IMO regulations. Uh, that caused fuel to be somewhat more expensive, but uh, the fleet hasn't sort of noticeably slowed down since then. It's it's going about 11 and a half knots recently. So this is something to look at when we talk about the dry bulk sector outlook later on. Indeed, there's quite a bit of room for the fleet to slow down further. So. Let me now turn to fleet development. Uh, you have been quite active on the transaction front, both selling older ships and getting uh, new ships on board. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, this fleet uh, renewal uh, activity that you have been doing. Well, you know, we we, we find a, a very um, a very good market uh, where we can get attractive prices for ships that you know may not be as fuel efficient as as some of the ships we'd we'd like to uh to have in the fleet 
Um, and so, you, you know, you may see another few sales here and there, depending on how the market goes. Um, but at the same time, we've managed to uh, negotiate quite long term charters in of uh, basically brand new latest technology, uh, super eco ships, uh, either built in Japan or built by Japanese uh, ship shipbuilding companies in the Philippines. Um, and, um, you know, we think this is a very attractive way to take advantage of the fuel efficiency of the latest generation new buildings without committing our capital to ships that are not able to burn zero carbon fuels. So you're referring to the seven ships that you're chartering in? Correct. So if I can ask you uh, two things here, uh, number one, uh, Traditionally, most of the uh, most of these uh, charter in uh, agreements have purchase options. So, did you have uh, them uh, as well? And the second question is, uh, why would you uh, opt for uh, charter in versus outright acquisition? So, uh, on the on the purchase options, I can't comment on that. But uh, in, in terms of the attraction of chartered in versus versus purchased. Uh, you know, the charter rates are quite attractive. Um, we have uh, the ability to extend these charters in um, if that's a good thing. But at the same time, if in, for example, 2030, uh, it, it looks like the way to go is to build ships that can burn ammonia or e-methanol or e-LNG, um, you know, we will not have committed our capital to these ships and we'll be able to use our capital to buy those even later generation ships with new technology. What I find very interesting, uh, Hamish, is you have you see a number of other companies going out and getting uh, new builds with dual fuel and so on. If I'm not mistaken, these vessels are conventional fuel, but you expect to reap the uh, benefits of lower fuel consumption because of their eco uh, Correct. The, the, these, these ships are conventional fuel ships. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the cost of uh, green methanol, for example, um, is, uh, we believe, uh, almost $4,000 per ton of fuel oil equivalent. Um, you know, and it, presumably will come down over time, but it's going to be very expensive. And, you know, the customers are going to have to be prepared to pay very high rates, you know, if, if fuel becomes that expensive. Now, of course, a carbon tax could make traditional fuel equally expensive. Uh, but in, in that case, having ships that burn traditional fuel very efficiently is probably just as attractive. Um, so, uh, you know, look, we want to make sure the, that Star Bulk is in a position to get ships that are burning zero carbon fuel, you know, assuming that that's the right thing to do uh, in, the, in the relatively near term. By chartering in these ships, we get the benefit of very, very low fuel consumption. Um, you know, the latest technology, and we're not committing our capital to a ship that only burns traditional fuels. Hamish, you already have a very large fleet, 125 vessels. That I think the largest fleet of a publicly listed uh, dry bulk company um, in the U.S. Any, any. Any plans for further expansion? I mean, you, you're already quite large. Well, we're we're always looking for opportunities to uh, to use our shares to do uh, mergers. Um, you know, it it, uh, it is helpful for our you know overhead per ship per day. Uh, it is mildly helpful for our operating cost per ship per day. Uh, it is mildly helpful for our revenue because we will, we will have better market knowledge to the extent we have more ships. 
And frankly, it is a good thing to maintain a, a market cap in the equity markets that is sort of mid cap in the bottom of the cycle. You know, it's, it's still the case, unfortunately, that dry bulk shipping companies are too small for most investors. That is for investors who invest most of the money. Um, so yes, growth is something we want to do. Now, let, let me, uh, touching up on the fleet for one more question. Uh, you are diversified across all segments of the dry bulk sector, from cape size down to supermax. Uh, what are the benefits of having this diversification across all sizes and segments? Well, you know, so uh, first of all, it's it, we're we're not diversified between vessel classes. So you know, we're 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 not you know owning dry bulk and containers or dry bulk and tankers, which we think you know the investment community would would not appreciate. Um, but so, but we are diversified uh, across vessel sizes in the dry bulk market, sure. and that has been very helpful to us. We like having, we like the structure of our fleet, and and we'd like to sort of keep it this way. Um, sometimes the supermaxes earn more than the capes. Um, you know, it's it's reasonably often that the Panamaxes earn more than the supermaxes or the capes. Uh, you know, because nobody's going to ship grain in a cape and if grain is needs to be shipped in quantity you want the largest ship you can use for for grain so panamaxes sometimes do well and in a, in a tight market the the capes can earn multiples of what the supers and the panamaxes can earn so you know we've benefited from having this diversification and and we we want to keep it that way so Moving forward uh, to the next question uh, on scrubber investments. You have been one of the pioneers uh, in uh, investing in scrubbers. So if you can share with us how uh, Starbuck Carriers continues to benefit from the fuel spread between high sulfur fuel oil and the very low sulfur fuel oil, and, and how does this contribute to your profitability? So, uh, you know, the, the, the scrubbers basically allow us to use uh, high sulfur heavy fuel oil when ships without scrubbers have to use very low sulfur fuel oil which costs considerably more um so you know uh, we we invested about 250 million dollars in our scrubbers including the costs of of the uh, idle time of the ships that that uh, you know were in dry dock for the scrubber installation and uh, you know we paid for the scrubbers in basically two and a half years. In the, in the middle of last year, they were fully paid for, and they've been earning a, a excellent profits for us since. In in Q1 of 2023, we averaged 185 dollars per ton of fuel that we burned, and we burn in the ships with scrubbers about 685,000 tons a year of uh, heavy fuel oil. So, you know, in, in for a hundred dollar spread between high sulfur and low sulfur fuel, that's 68 and a half million dollars a year. You know, for a $200 million spread, it's, you know, uh, twice that, you know, uh, 137 million tons, uh, $137 million of savings. So the scrubbers are producing a very high return on investment. So the, the the amount that you mentioned, those savings are a direct addition to the profitability that comes from the operation of the ship under spot or time charters, correct? Correct. Yeah, for, for, for voyage charters, we get the money directly. For time charters, we negotiate with the charterer to get the money, but we do get it. Yeah. I mean, the point I wanted to make exactly is that yeah. this uh, and that's how it enhances your profitability. Yes. So, but let's talk uh, overall. How do increasing fuel prices affect the spot or the time charter rates? Well, it, it, it's somewhat counterintuitive, um, but actually, unless 
fuel prices are so high that they have a, a seriously negative impact on economic activity, we directly benefit from higher fuel prices. And, and that's different from the container ship business. And it's even different from the tanker business because of course they're carrying the fuel. So higher fuel prices have a various effects on them. But for us, basically, if fuel prices go up, then the fleet slows down unless charter rates go up by the same amount in percentage terms. Now, if fuel prices go up and the fleet slows down, we can't carry as much stuff. And if the demand for carrying stuff is not affected by the increase in charter rates, which to a first approximation, it's not affected, um, then the charter rates will double if fuel prices double. It's a direct benefit to us. We want fuel prices as high as possible. Interesting. So now let me go to the next question. Uh, you, Petros. Uh, and by the way, sorry to interrupt. That is another reason why zero carbon fuels are going to be very good for our business because that is the ultimate fuel price increase. Very interesting. So moving on to the next question that I was starting on, you, Petros, and the whole management team of uh, Starbucks, you have repeatedly uh, emphasized exactly your investments in uh, environmental compliance and, uh, and efficiency. So you just announced the completion of the ballast water uh, installation program across the fleet in line with the EHI and CII regulations. And you continue investing uh, to upgrade the fleet further. So can you tell us a little bit about the steps that uh, Starbuck is taking to improve fuel consumption, reduce your environmental footprint, and enhance the commercial attractiveness of the fleet? Sure. Um, so on, on many of our ships, we're putting uh, energy saving devices on. Um, and uh, they seem to help quite a bit, uh, you know, between five and eight uh, percent, and uh, you know, the, the the we're putting uh, in place uh, Mevis ducts and other similar devices, which basically uh, affect the water flow before the propeller in a way that makes the propeller more efficient. Uh, we're putting on propeller boss cap fins that affect the water flow immediately after the propeller, which make the propeller more efficient. Uh, and you know the combination is worth about 8% in fuel savings. Um, we have been a co-sponsor of the uh, European Union Gators uh, program, uh, looking into the uh, improvement in fuel efficiency that can result from using something called gate rudders. Um, which again make the propeller more efficient and seem to be able to save, you know, 15 to even as much as 30% of the fuel, which is amazing. Um, we're looking at carbon capture. Um, we've been trialing two different technologies of carbon capture on board our ships. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it appears as though it, it works. It's expensive, but it, it does appear to work. Um, and, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, uh, basically fancier, uh, anti-fouling systems, uh, because fouling is, is probably the single most important, uh, impact on, uh, the, the fuel efficiency of an existing ship. Um, you know, we're looking at fancy paints at, uh, ultrasonic anti-fouling at, uh, uh, hull cleaning robots. You know, if 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 we can get a fleet of hull cleaning robots uh, working, you know, we may be able to hire uh, a bunch of video gamers in Athens wearing virtual reality goggles, driving our hull cleaning robots uh, on our fleet connected by 4G cellular connections. So, you know, it, it will will become a tech company. So, Hamish, the way I look at, uh, you know, the way I take what you're describing is that uh, you do have a very large uh, fleet. Uh, you are taking the steps to upgrade that fleet to make it as environmentally friendly and uh, fuel efficient as we can. Absolutely. 
while also preparing for the potential next phase if and when we have a winner with the green fuels. Yes, yes, and and you know, we, and and in terms of of green fuels, I mean, for example, we we participated as a, as a partner in a feasibility study of a green corridor from Australia to East Asia, and it it looks it looks practical. It looks practical. It's it's just a matter of who is going to pay the bill. Uh, it's it's either our customers or or you know, the, the government's involved. But one of the things that, if I can make a remark that uh, is very particularly important is, yes, as the industry is preparing for the next phase of exploring the green fuels, at the same time, conventional fuels will remain there for quite some time. So yes. before turning to the very next chapter, we better improve the efficiency of the chapter we're in now and which will most likely be there for a number of years going forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, the, the, the fuel efficiency of uh, ships, of, of new building ships is it, it probably they, they burn, you know, ar around half of the fuel that ships, you know, a generation ago burned. And you know, it, it it seems as though we can probably get that figure down to half again. So um, you know, there's there's a, a big room for improvement. So let's uh, uh, turn now to chartering strategy. Uh, given the market conditions and your sector outlook, what is the fleet deployment strategy today? Times versus spot, and uh, has your uh, employment strategy changed over the last year um you know basically um our balance sheet is extremely strong and um for the most part you do better over the long term keeping your fleet in the spot market and the exception we found is um in 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 q1 basically which which tends to be very weak and uh, it, it nevertheless seems even though it is well known that q1 is the weakest quarter we believe we do better taking advantage of a strong q3 and chartering the ships out to cover q1 where possible um and so you know that is typically what we what we do and what we intend to keep doing we were not really able to do it in 2022 to cover Q1 of 2023, um, but you know when it is possible to do it, um, it it seems to be the right thing to do, and and so we're we're largely spot at the moment. Exactly. So if we take out the seven ships that you chartered in that have a long term charter, the majority of your fleet, even if chartered, is for shorter durations. Yes, yes, and 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 the you know the the ships we've chartered in we may charter out in in spot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, now let's go to liquidity and debt. Uh, if you would be kind to share with us where you are today in terms of liquidity and leverage, as you pointed out in your Q1 presentation, year on year your adjusted debt decreased by forty nine percent. And at the same mm -hmm. time, your cash and liquidity increased by 185%. So where do you stand today in terms of uh, leverage, liquidity, and is there a desired uh, leverage level that uh, you want to reach? Sure. Well, you know, look, we're, we're paying down almost $200 million worth of debt every year. We're basically paying down the amortization on our bank debt. And... Um, uh, you know, we're not refinancing the the amortization, um, so uh, we're bringing our debt down relatively quickly. Um, our net debt to total asset value is below twenty five percent at this point, so we're we're pretty comfortable with that. But you know, we plan to keep going and until we get basically net leverage down to zero. Now, you know, that's in the current market environment. Um, when we see, you know, uh, breathtaking business opportunities to build, for example, you know, 
new technology ships using new technology zero carbon fuels, we may borrow money and we may see that that's a tremendous business opportunity. But you know, at the, at the moment, we 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 think that being relatively unleveraged, uh, being in a position to pay large dividends, um, uh, being very liquid is is the right thing to do. But that exactly brings me to the next question on capital allocations. So clearly, you have a very robust cash flow. How do you prioritize it? Uh, e growth on renewal, uh, debt reduction, buybacks, dividends. Is there a priority oh, that you're using? In in the current business environment. You know, we basically intend to pay down debt as fast as it amortizes. Um, we intend to use the operating cash flow after debt service to pay dividends. And to the extent we can get an arbitrage between the price at which we sell vessels and the price at which we can buy back shares, we might sell vessels and buy back shares. Um, that's a harder trade than it sounds, uh, basically because we don't know at what price we'll be able to buy back shares. And you know we never really know until we do it uh, as to the price at which we can sell vessels. But when there's a big enough spread and we believe we have the ability to do that, we'll, we'll do it. Um, but, um, you know, in terms of operating cash flow, we will prioritize the dividend. And that brings me exactly to, to dividend policy. Uh, we have seen uh, different companies follow different policies. Starbucks has a very well-defined uh, dividend payout policy, and it's on the general side. So I wanted to ask you, why have you opted for this particular dividend policy with a more generous payout as opposed to keeping more money uh, in-house and using it for other purposes? Well, I mean, at, at this point, you know, we think that um, new builds are very expensive. Um, we think that the technology in new builds is changing very rapidly and that um, we want to wait a little bit and and you know, see what's available, even frankly, if it if it uh, involves building traditionally fueled new buildings, we think the technology of traditionally fueled new buildings is changing pretty rapidly also. Um, and you know we we look at the uh, at the market value of ships relative to charter rates. And you know we compare that with the returns that our shareholders can get with capital, and you know frankly we think it's 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 the right thing to do to give our shareholders the the cash flow, uh, and and let them decide how to invest it. Um, you know we, we we're trying to do what's the the best thing for the shareholders, and you know our board, you know have quite a quite a few shares between them. Uh, not to mention our management. So uh, you know we're we're incentivized well to to benefit the shareholders to the greatest possible degree. And that brings me now to the concluding question uh, of uh, our uh, podcast today about discussion on the outlook of the dry bulk sector. Uh, if you can share with us, is this going to be? Everybody seems to be quite positive on uh, the fundamentals of the sector looking ahead, looking ahead. But is it going to be primarily in terms of catalyst, the supply side? Is it going to be the demand side? How do you see the balance between the two? Well, the, the demand for dry bulk shipping movements has you know, historically grown more or less hand in hand with the size of the world economy. It's 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 you you haven't seen massive increases in dry bulk movements. You haven't seen massive drops pretty much keeps up with world GDP. But the supply of dry bulk ships varies a lot. And at the moment, we've got just about the smallest order book in the history of dry bulk shipping. Um, and you know, while the fleet is projected to grow a little bit over the next few years, uh, 
you know, the, the growth seems to be lower even than the relatively modest growth in world GDP, you know, perhaps a couple of percent. And, you know, that is not assuming much scrapping. Um, and yet, with the new uh, environmental regulations coming out and the, I think, quite considerable commercial pressure on ships that are high consumers of fuel, you know, I think we'll see a, a very uh, uh, stratified market with ships that consume the smallest amount of fuel being much more attractive than ships that consume more fuel. Um, and, you know, if we get, for example, the bottom third of the fleet in terms of fuel consumption being scrapped, the upper two thirds of the fleet is not going to be able to speed up um, to compensate because they will burn too much fuel if they speed up. Uh, you know, the, the, the pressure to reduce carbon emissions is going to lead to very high charter rates, either through um, the uh, the worst fuel the worst fuel consumers being scrapped, uh, or through um, the need to incentivize construction of ammonia and methanol and ELNG and so on fueled uh, new technology ships which will only be ordered if the charter rates are very high. Um, so, you know, I think this is going to support the dry bulk business over the next 10 years. So if I can uh, repeat what you said, minimal fleet supply. So it's not really the demand side, it's the fleet supply side. Minimal uh, yeah. supply order book, expectation for increased scrapping, uh, now, port congestion has been alleviated to a large extent, uh, but we may see slow steaming coming in in a bigger way because of the environmental regulations. So all yeah. of that together. Yeah, and port congestion can come back very quickly. You know, basically, port congestion lets the air out of a of a uh, deflating balloon rather more quickly than than it would deflate otherwise. But when when the air is coming back in, port congestion makes it come back in faster. So, um, you know, but if it happens, port congestion will uh, further uh, aggravate the, the fleet supply. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's leverage on the upside as well as the downside. Well, thank you very much. I think we have exhausted uh, you know quite a number of topics. It's been uh, particularly insightful. Uh, thank you very very much, Hamish, to, for being with us today, and. Uh, it's been Thank nice. you. Yeah. Thank you.